professor said, I'm uh, very glad uh, to be again on the academic soil because, uh, as mentioned, uh, I used to lecture also at the university and I, I was the head of a, uh, of a think tank. So obviously now as an official, uh, it's, it's a bit of a different task, uh, a bit of a different perspective. Uh, but I welcome the opportunity, you know, to, to, to come back to my previous years, you know, when uh, when I uh, was engaged academically. So uh, basically, I think uh, I will be. I will try to keep my introduction rather short, uh, to half an hour, so that we can allow, you know, uh, I can allow for your questions and, and comments and and reflections. Uh, so before the lecture, I, I, I asked the professor to prepare uh, the map of Europe. Uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, kind of explain to you uh, how we uh, define or how we view Central Europe uh, because there is virtually two perspectives. Uh, one of them is, um, I would say, purely geographical. Uh, even in that sense, you know, we don't have a total agreement, you know, what we mean by, by Central Europe. So just to give you some example, uh, of course Germany considers itself to be the center of Europe in Central Europe. Uh, from our perspective, countries like the Czech Republic and Poland would be Eastern Europe, France would be Western Europe. If you look at us, the Czech Republic, yeah, our concept of Central Europe is very much kind of linked to what uh, was already defined in the 19th century is the, the so-called Middle Age Oil Park. Yeah, so it's, it's basically the, the, the countries of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. But we also consider Germany to be Central Europe, Poland, our southern neighbors. If you move further east, uh, Hungary uh, considers Central Europe also the countries that, uh, for instance, contain significant Hungarian-speaking minorities. Uh, as you might know, Hungary used to be much bigger before the, uh, before the First World War. Uh, so for them, virtually the geographical uh, notion of Central Europe includes also Slovakia, but also Ukraine, Romania, Serbia, and Croatia. Uh, basically the surrounding countries. And if you look further up, for Poland, also the Baltic countries are part of Central Europe. Yeah? Uh, if you think about it, it's basically each of the countries considers itself to be in the center of Central Europe. Yeah? So uh, it just shows you that even geographically it's not uh, kind of so easy you know, to define what the central, uh, what the central Europe is. Uh, but, well, Apart from geography, of course, we have also, let's say, a more kind of, uh, let's say, geopolitical look uh, at, at Central and Eastern Europe. And I think that perhaps this is more important for us. Yeah? Uh, when we speak about Central, or we often use the term Central and Eastern Europe, we relate to the group of countries uh, that uh, used to be in the communist or the Soviet Union. Oh, okay, technology. Yeah. <laughs> I try to speak up as much as possible, but might be better so that I can thank you. So geopolitically, uh, when we speak about Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we virtually mean the countries that were formerly in the Soviet bloc, but after 1989, you know, the, uh, the year of the big changes that in our country we call the Velvet Revolution, you know, the um, kind of peaceful overthrow of the communist rule, uh, basically decided to go west, if I to put it that way. Uh, to integrates with what we call the Euro-Atlantic structures, by which we basically mean two organizations, and that's NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Alliance, and the European Union. So, Central and Eastern Europe includes the three Baltic countries here, uh, then the so-called Visegrad Four group, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, uh, Slovenia, Lately also Romania and Bulgaria, that exceeded the European Union a bit later uh, than, than, than the other countries that I have named here. And last but not least, Croatia. With the Balkan countries, uh, it, it is a bit difficult, you know, because they themselves, they view themselves, you know, as part of, of the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, but they are not in the European Union yet, even though they are the so-called applicant countries, you know, so they, their ultimate aim is to join the European, uh, European Union. So this is more of a geopolitical view uh, of, our, uh, of our region. Uh, 
I'm, I would like to mention uh, especially the fact that uh, uh, the region, of course, has been, you know, in, in the past quite uh, 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 in a geopolitical turbulence, I would say. Yeah. So after the fall of communism, there was a, there was uh, a moment when basically all the countries uh, decided, uh, you know, to opt for this integration uh, with the Western European or Euro-Atlantic structures. So one of the motives of the, uh, let, let's say, our foreign policy after 1989 was the so-called return to Europe. Yeah, which means basically, you know, integrating with uh, uh, the Western European, uh, with the Western European countries, and uh, this was going through different, I would say, paths. Yeah, uh, through different kind of uh, initiatives. Uh, it was a bit diff different, you know, in the in the former Yugoslavia. You know, this is a different story, which I leave aside for the time being. You might know that the case of Yugoslavia was a very uh, was a very sad and very unfortunate one. Uh, because uh, at the beginning of 1990s, uh, we had a basically um, a violent, um, uncontrolled uh, process of disintegration. Some of the countries, uh, they, let's say, ended up quite well, like Slovenia, where there was a, what we call the Seven Day War, which was not actually a war, it was just some kind of clashes after which Slovenia proclaimed independence. Uh, but uh, with a very kind of prolonged and bloody conflict, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And of course, the uh, last bit, you know, was the, uh, the, 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 the conflict when Kosovo uh, separated from uh, Serbia uh, in 1990, 1999, with the official declaration of, uh, uh, of independence about a decade later. Uh, I think the, fir the, the first uh, initiative that appeared you know, in the region uh, after 1989 was actually an initiative or an organization that today you actually don't hear much about. Yeah? Uh, I wouldn't say that it lost completely its relevance, you know, but certainly it's not the main format of uh, the cooperation among our countries. And that was the so-called uh, Quadragonal, uh, which uh, included uh, two countries in Western Europe, Austria and Italy and two countries in former Soviet bloc, which was Hungary and Yugoslavia at that time. Yeah. And the aim of this initiative was basically to show that the, the countries that were originally on the two parts of the Iron Curtain, the West and the East, can cooperate uh, you know, and, you know, in a spirit of a kind of mutual, um, uh, of a mutual kind of recognition and uh, 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 spirit of cooperation. Uh, of course, uh, it got a bit complicated with the uh, early disintegration of Yugoslavia, but uh, quite uh, soon after this quadragonal was created, it uh, actually was extended to pentagonal because Czechoslovakia uh, became a part um, uh, of that uh, uh, initiative and shor shortly after that also Poland. And, uh, you know, successively other countries of uh, this region joined uh, this uh, uh, concept, which became the so-called Central European Initiative. So when you hear today the, 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 this abbreviation CEI, uh, it, um, it relates to the Central European Initiative, which was actually the first uh, format of, uh, let's say, regional cooperation after 1989. But today, uh, it's, uh, as I said, I mean, it still exists, but it's more or less uh, focus on very soft issues uh, such as you know people to people contacts and the support of tourism for instance uh, but it still it still uh, does exist uh, another regional integration uh, project that uh, uh, started soon after 1989 was the so called yes shall i uh, Yeah, the mouse. Okay, okay, right. Okay, I know I know how to do it now. Um, uh, another project which embarked uh, soon after 1989 was the uh, the economic integration uh, uh, between the three, formerly three, and then four countries, which also constitute the Visegrad Group. Uh, so Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. The so-called Central European Free Trade Area, CIFTA. CEFTA. Uh, uh, the aim of this uh, initiative was basically to show that these countries can cooperate uh, on economic uh, terms even before they join the European Union, which was the ultimate aim. 
Yeah. So uh, basically, the the aim of the uh, of the free trade area was, as uh, as we know, uh, is usually the case of the free trade areas. That means that the countries participating, they basically uh, remove obstacles to trade. Uh, so they keep their own tariff policy, their own customs policy. But for the mutual trade, you know, they uh, there is a liberalization. So it's um, you know kind of facilitates the free flow of uh, goods. Uh, in between, in between those countries, also the cent uh, Central European free trade area has actually moved more to the, uh, I would say, the south of, southeast of Europe. So the countries that are uh, part of that today are basically uh, the countries that are aspiring for the membership of the European Union. Uh, obviously, our membership uh, in this organization ceased. Uh, with our accession to the European Union, because it's not compatible, you know, to be basically a member of two free trade blocs. Yeah? Uh, now I'm going to mention the third uh, regional initiative, which um, I would say is probably the most important for us. It's, it's, in, the cor it's in the cornerstone of uh, the regional cooperation, and that's the, the so-called Visegrad cooperation, uh, which originally included three countries, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland. But as you know, our country decided for the so-called Velvet Divorce uh, in 1993. So since the 1st of January 1993, we have peacefully divided the country into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So the Visegrad III became Visegrad IV, and this is what it remained until, un, un, until today. Um, uh, so this initiative was launched in 1991, so uh, more or less one and a half years after the, the fall of communism. And it is called Visegrad because uh, the leaders of the three countries at the time met at the, small uh, at, the, at the small place at the castle called Visegrad, which is between Slovakia and Hungary, more or less here, north of Budapest. Uh, and it had a very symbolical meaning um, because uh, it was not the first time that the leaders met there. Uh, it actually alluded to one event that happened very, very long time ago, notably in 1355, when the three kings met also in Visegrad. It was the king of Poland, Casimir III, the king of Bohemia, John I of Luxembourg, and the king of Hungary, Louis I of Anjou. Yeah? And uh, the reason that they uh, met was also to forge some kind of regional cooperation. Uh, but that kind of regional cooperation was, of course, different from the one that we envisaged in 1991. In 1355, they met mainly to uh, envisage a merchant route that would bypass the city of Vienna, yeah? which you see was here, uh, which was uh, uh, kind of abusing, it was the so-called staple port at that time, which means that uh, all, the, uh, all the goods that were that the merchants, merchants passed through Vienna had to be uh, uh, unloaded there and had to be offered, you know, to the uh, to the uh, to the local market, which was not advantageous for uh, you know the Czech, the Polish, and the Hungarian merchants. So they decided that they will kind of bypass uh, uh, Vienna for trade between these three kingdoms. Where our presidents met in 1991. The aim was different. It was not to bypass Vienna, but actually to bring us closer to Vienna, yeah? uh, symbolically speaking. Uh, uh, the aim was to declare our common intention to become the member of the two organizations that I mentioned here, NATO and the European Union. Yeah? So this was the main um, kind of motive behind the Visegrad cooperation, to show that we are able to cooperate together on our way to the uh, European Union and NATO. Uh, it's, uh, it was an endeavor that uh, I would say was uh, successful because we both, I mean all of us, all, all the, all the th originally three, then four countries managed to join these two organizations, even though, uh, to be honest, I mean there were some hurdles on the way. Yeah? For instance, uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, shortly after the division, uh, of the country in 1993 uh, uh, was for some time kind of um, 
put off the track, I would say, because uh, there was a, um, let's say, quasi-authoritarian regime of Prime Minister Mečiar. And because by the Western European countries, uh, Slovakia was simply not seen ripe enough, you know, to be able to join the two organizations, uh, uh, they were uh, not, you know, in the first wave. Uh, uh, so uh, for, for some time, you know, the Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary were the front runners. Um, but Slovakia after 1998, when it was, when Mr. Mečar was ousted of power and uh, let's say kind of democratic parties took over, they managed to catch up quite quickly. So the three countries joined uh, NATO, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary joined NATO in 1999. All the four countries joined the European Union in 2004 and uh, actually, Slovakia joined NATO in 2004 as well. So there you can see that actually the goal uh, which was behind the Visegrad cooperation was achieved at a relatively short period of time. We're speaking about 1991, the beginning of the Visegrad cooperation, the accession to the European Union and in case of Slovakia to NATO, uh, 2004. Yeah, so more or less we are speaking some 13 years. In case of NATO, it was actually much quicker. Yeah, we're speaking about eight years in case of Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary. Uh, you can say that's okay. 2004, the goal is achieved, right? Is there any point of keeping the cooperation uh, running, up and running? Uh, well, we decided that this is the case, yes. Uh, because uh, even in the EU and NATO, we can cooperate more closely together and we can somehow try to influence the decision making in the two organizations uh, as a regional bloc, yes. Uh, because as a regional bloc, we, have, we are sharing some characteristics, yeah? We are sharing some interests. Uh, we have some preferences, you know, that we want to pursue as also as the members of these two much bigger organizations. So uh, let's have a small reflection on what are these, uh, uh, let's say, specificities uh, of, uh, of the Visegrad uh, group um, when it comes to the NATO and the European Union agenda. I'll start with NATO. Uh, if you think about the, our region, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a region which was during the whole of the Cold War dominated by Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, two of our countries, uh, or actually three, uh, notably former Czechoslovakia and Hungary, has a direct experience from uh, basically Soviet-led invasion during the Cold War. In Hungary, it was the crashing of the Hungarian uprising in 1956. And in Czechoslovakia, it was basically the termination of the so-called Prague Spring, yeah, which was uh, kind of the upheaval, you know, of the kind of pro-democratic forces who wanted to uh, bring back, you know, some kind of plurality and uh, free uh, political competition. Uh, if you look at Poland, it has um, uh, even, I would say, worse experience with the kind of Russian domination than the other countries. Uh, and until today, if you talk to the Poles, there is two traumatic events in their history uh, where Russia took part. One of them is uh, the so-called Triple Division of Poland, uh, which happened uh, at the end of the 18th century, when the Kingdom of Poland was actually divided between the three surrounding powers. Uh, Prussia, its predecessor of Germany in the West, Austria, in, or the Habsburg Empire in the South, and the Russian Empire in the East. So basically, if you think that, you know, I mean, uh, Russia took a big part of the eastern, of the eastern part of Poland and uh, dominated it until the regaining of independence uh, in 1918. And the other one was just what happened preceding the Second World War, the so-called uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, when uh, basically the Soviet Union and Germany made a secret deal to simultaneously invade Poland from the West and the East and divide it you know, in, in, in half. So what I'm trying to get to is that uh, when we join NATO, uh, our group of countries uh, you know, try to kind of uh, bring a more 
I wouldn't say anti-Russian sentiment, but I would say a, a great deal of realism, you know, of the uh, the policy towards Russia due to the historical experience uh, that we had with the uh, with the Russian uh, domination. The other important element was uh, uh, that I would say our countries are the so-called, uh, or I call them, instinctive Atlanticists. Atlanticists means that they, uh, you know, support a very strong uh, relation with the United States. Uh, it also has some kind of historical explanation because uh, the United States, in the view of many uh, of our people, were the ones who have never basically betrayed us. Uh, as opposed to, for instance, in the Czech case, the United Kingdom and France, uh, who concluded back in 1938, the so-called Munich Agreement, where basically, you know, uh, they together with uh, uh, the Nazi Germany at the time and Italy forced us, you know, to give up um, part of our borderland, which was inhabited mainly by the German, German population, yeah? So there is a great degree of, well, I would say, affinity to the United States as the main guarantor of uh, security and also democracy, yeah? When it comes to the, um, uh, the, 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 let's say, the EU, but not only the, the, the EU agenda, there are also some, let's say, elements, you know, that uh, I, I would like to highlight uh, that I think our group has kind of brought uh, uh, to the forefront of the, uh, of the EU uh, attention or uh, policies. Uh, the first one, again, has to do with our, with the fact that we had to transform, you know, basically from communist totalitarian countries to um, uh, democracies and free market economies. Uh, so there's this kind of transformation experience uh, has made us to focus a bit more on the issues of democracy and human rights, and we want to support it also in the external relations. Yeah? So um, um, I think an important part of our agenda is uh, you know, that we are trying to help the countries who are maybe now in a similar position you know, that we were in 19... 90s or that we were uh, even before under under communism yeah so it's the support for democracy and human rights uh, which you could see you know on many occasions in the EU for instance the Czech Republic was very vocal uh, in 2000 around 2005 2006 quite uh, early after our uh, accession to the EU when the EU was decided deciding you know how to um, uh, whether to normalize the relations with Cuba with the Cuban regime you know and we were actually saying that uh, uh, it's not the time yet you know to kind of cozy up you know to to Fidel Castro uh, another quite uh, important uh, uh, area uh, when we speak about economics is that inside the European Union uh, I think we are one of the uh, main promoters of uh, uh, the free trade, uh, because all our economies have profited immensely you know, from the free trade after the fall of communism and our integration, not only in the European Union, but also the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, so we are trying to promote as a kind of liberal uh, trade policy uh, in the European Union vis-a-vis -vis other countries uh, as, as, as we can. And also, uh, uh, that relates internally also that we are trying to have to make a kind of um, a very um, a liberal internal market inside the European Union, uh, which more or less is already liberal, you know, but there is some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's, it's still not completed, for instance, in the area of services. Yeah, There are still obstacles inside the European Union for the provision of services uh, among the member states. We are also pushing it uh, for its completion for in, in the new areas, such as, for instance, the G digital technologies uh, or uh, in the energy area, etc. If you look at the uh, foreign policy, uh, of the European Union, then we are uh, there. Are, I would say particularly two elements that we are supporting as a group. First of them is <clears throat> developing and fostering relations with the countries in Eastern Europe, uh, namely the so-called Eastern Partnership. That's a policy which was actually launched ten years ago during the Czech presidency of the European Union, uh, and it uh, has an aim of kind of bringing closer to the European Union. Uh, the six countries, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and the three countries that you can't see there in the Caucasus here, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Yeah? Uh, this is especially the Czech Republic and Poland have been very strong supporters of this policy. And the other 
area uh, um, includes the Western Balkan countries, which is uh, the former Yugoslavia, where we also try to support very strongly their accession to the European Union, because we are convinced, you know, that uh, well, uh, you know, they deserve that. After all the traumas, you know, uh, of the wars in 1990s, where actually European Union was not able to, to to stop that bloodshed at the time because we didn't have the tools, and maybe even the courage at the time. Uh, so we are supporting, you know, the accession basically of the uh, countries such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, uh, it's North Macedonia, Albania, Albania, and Kosovo and Montenegro. Yeah. Uh, so this is, I would say, also another element that we brought um, uh, into, the, into the discourse. Perhaps, because as I, as I said, I don't want to speak too long, it's important for you to realize that our cooperation as the Visegrad group is mainly informal. So basically, we don't have uh, a permanent institution like a secretariat or something. The only institution that we do have is the so-called International Visegrad Fund, uh, which is seated in Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. And uh, it is a very, very useful tool, which supports uh, the cooperation in, mainly in between the four countries, but in, at the level of, let's say, the people-to-people -people contacts, civil society, NGOs, etc. Yeah. And it actually proved, out, proved uh, as a very useful tool in also kind of bringing our people closer together. Uh, because, well, as you can imagine, the history is still present also in, in Central Europe. There are various animosities, you know, various prejudices, you know, uh, between us. Uh, the overall picture is, of course, good, you know. I mean, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, I wouldn't say we are, we are getting on friendly terms with each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, we still have to do a lot, you know, to overcome, you know, some of the historical grievances. So this is exactly what the, what the International Visegrad Fund represents. So all the four governments are uh, contributing to the fund, but we also managed uh, quite successfully to convince other countries to uh, contribute to the fund, uh, to support uh, projects which go beyond our region. And I'm very glad that also the Republic of Korea, the gov your government is also one of the contributors uh, to the project and uh, is supporting uh, uh, some of the projects mainly in Eastern Europe, uh, in the Eastern Partnership that I mentioned, but also in, uh, in the Western Balkans. We managed to get other donors on board, I think Switzerland, Norway, Canada. Uh, so you see that the scope of operation of the Visegrad Fund has extended quite a lot. Uh, Professor asked me to also to, to, to mention a bit about the internal kind of coordination and structure, so I'll do that very briefly, and you can ask me more questions if you want. So there is a, uh, in fact, as I said, it's informal. The International Visegrad Fund is the only institution. But our uh, government officials meet on a regular basis, including our president, uh, prime ministers, ministers, and even at the lower level, so for instance, uh, as the policy planning directors of the ministers of foreign affairs, we meet, I would say, more or less on a bi-monthly basis. Um, sometimes it's just the four of us. Sometimes we invite our other countries uh, to join in. Also, the political di directors uh, meet very often. So there is a very, very kind of wide network of, um, um, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, working contacts at, uh, at various levels. It doesn't, of course, concern only the minister of foreign affairs. It, co it concerns other ministries. So today the patchwork is very, very kind of varied and very, uh, the contacts are very intensive and uh, I would say very direct also. Um, uh, at, the, at the higher level, I mean at the political level, uh, what is quite important in terms of coordination is the fact that our prime ministers regularly meet ahead of the European Council. The European Council is, uh, well, I think most of you are uh, studying, or some of you at least are studying European studies, so you know the European Council is the most important political body in the European Union. It's when our prime ministers meet and they decide the most important, let's say, strategic questions. Yeah? So before every European Council, there is a coordination between the, um, uh, the Visegrad uh, prime ministers. Yeah? The same goes for the Foreign Affairs Council. Yeah? So our foreign ministers, uh, before they meet, they have a coordination 
uh, you know, to kind of speak uh, about the positions and see if we can you know, act as a group. Uh, because the truth is that if you look at the group together, it's actually quite a strong one. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, if we combine our economies, uh, we would be the fifth biggest economy in the European Union and probably the 12th or the 13th in the world. Yeah? So it's, it's already quite a, quite, quite a big power. But obviously, it's not to say that we agree on every single issue. You know? uh, of course, there are uh, things on which we have a uh, slightly different take. Uh, but more or less, I would say that on the things that I mentioned here, that we were bringing you know, some kind of uh, joint voice you know, to the European or NATO decision making, there is usually, uh, there is usually an agreement. Um, so uh, there is a, there's actually three, three different presidencies in the, in the Visegrad group. The one relates to the uh, presidency of the Visegrad Fund, the, the, the one and only institution, which basically means that on a rotating basis we appoint a director of the fund. Yeah? Uh, then there is a, um, also our presidents meet, but that's more symbolical. So there is a different kind of rotation. Uh, it's not exactly the same as in the fund, but it's always, you know, like one country after another and then again. And the third, uh, there's probably the most important one, is the presidency in the group as such, where all the other format meets. Uh, so this is when uh, you hear, for instance, that we are, now it's the Slovak presidency, which will end in June, and then in July, uh, it will be the Czech Republic who will take over, and it's always for a year. Yeah, so we'll have the presidency from the 1st of July until the 30th of June next year, and then it will be taken over by Poland, and then Hungary, and then again. Yeah? So it's a, it's a kind of equal rotation basis. Okay, as I really want to cut it short so that I can allow for your questions, let me just uh, perhaps mention the last two other regional formats that are relatively new. They are probably not so important as the Visegrad group, but you might come across them. And uh, uh, so it, I think it's important for you to at least be aware of their existence. One, which is actually relating to NATO, is the so-called Bucharest format, or the B9, or Bucharest 9, which uh, is, assembles um, nine member states of NATO on the so-called eastern flank of the alliance. So it's the three Baltic countries, plus the Visegrad four, so that's seven, plus Romania and Bulgaria. Yeah. Uh, the reason uh, why this group, and again, it's an informal group, it functions within NATO, uh, it is the, gr the group of uh, allies that is kind of um, uh, more exposed to the uh, let's say the Russian threat, or at least that's the way we view ourselves. Yeah, so there is some kind of strategic interest uh, when, for instance, it was this group that was um, arguing that we need uh, kind of a stronger presence of the Allied forces uh, in the Baltic and the Black Sea region. Yeah. So this is the Bucharest Nine, and one last that I want to mention, it's, it appeared a few years, only a few years ago, is the so-called three, three Seas Initiative. Uh, this, by the Three Seas, we mean the Baltic Sea here, the Adriatic Sea, and the Black Sea. So again, it it's assembles basically the countries of um, uh, Central Eastern Europe. And the aim of this initiative is uh, to basically improve uh, connectivity between the north and the south. Because when you think about our region and the logic that I try to explain, you know, that we were trying to kind of integrate mainly with the Western countries, it means that also our infrastructure was mainly oriented on improving, in the Czech case, for instance, uh, the connectivity with Germany and Austria. Yeah? The same went for Poland, the same went for Slovenia, for Hungary. Yeah? As a result, you know, with kind of you know, omitted that we also need to improve the connectivity in that direction. Yeah. So this initiative, which was very much pushed forward by especially Croatia and Poland, uh, has, you know, an aim of trying to improve this. It is a, a relatively new phenomenon, so we don't exactly know. I mean, it's at the beginning, you know, there are some projects. Uh, uh, there is also come the, the countries uh, committed to common funding, just for your uh, uh, information, 
It includes uh, also only the countries that are in the European Union. Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, Austria, and the three Baltic countries. Yeah. So basically, again, apart from Austria, all the others are ex-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. From the Czech perspective, it was important to get Germany on board, yeah, so that it does not look like an, an initiative that is supposed to you know, create, let's say, another dividing line you know, between the, the East and the West. And we claim that also still Germany is by far the most important uh, partner for the whole region. Uh, because just to give you an illustration, 30% of our trade is with Germany alone. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a really dominant economic actor in our region. <laughs> 